Sweet. So this is by name the Cartersville First Baptist Church men's class, but we've got several in attendance and these aren't lessons just for men. This is lessons for everybody. We're studying the Gospel of John. This week we're going to continue in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, we've been studying a conversation that Nicodemus has had with Jesus. He has come to Jesus by night to have an intimate conversation with him. And we started that last week. And before we get too far, I want for us to read the first 21 verses again of John chapter 3 together so that we understand the full context of the conversation. And then we'll dive into what it really means. We'll get back into the nitty gritty. So um, I'm just going to go in order of who's on my screen right here. So um, let's see, Dad, you're up first. Can you read for me verses 1 through 8 of John chapter 3? Ben, if you'll read 9 through 15. And Pete, you're next if you'll read 16 through 21. Dad, you're muted. Thank you. You're good. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. How can these things be, asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I assure you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things in heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love, loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates light, hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Very good. So there's a man who has come to talk to Jesus and the occasion of him coming and talking to Jesus is the Passover feast. If we remember from weeks before, we've been traveling around uh, the countryside here in Israel, and we started in Bethany. We, we went up to a place called Cana in Galilee, dropped down to Capernaum for just a few days, 
and Capernaum. And then from there, he goes to Jerusalem. And in, in, in Jerusalem, Jesus first goes into the temple, cleanses the temple with a whip that he makes out of cords. Uh, that's his very first, like, roaring onto the scene act, very public act. And then he stays in Jerusalem for the next few days in verses 23 through 25 of John chapter 2 and continues to perform signs. And many believed in him, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them. The root words for those in that context are, are the same, which, which tells us that Jesus didn't really believe in their believing, that there's a level at which they didn't believe that he was a teacher come from God or even a prophet or even the Savior. And then here comes Nicodemus. And let's review. What do we remember about Nicodemus? Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. What's a Pharisee, Ben? Well, it's a, it's, it's a religious leader of the time. I've also had some political dealings as well. Okay. All right. So if I was to ask you, what's the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee, what biggest, might you say? I would say the biggest difference is the belief in the afterlife. Okay, good. Yeah, the, the Sadducees don't believe in the afterlife. No afterlife, specifically no resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. um, the end result of that is they also didn't believe in angels. If there's no afterlife, there's no spiritual realm after this, there's no angels. And as far as doctrine goes, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. That's the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, which if you ever teach Awana with the, 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 the elementary school kids, that's Genesis, Explodus, Leviticals, Deuteronometry, and Numbers. So that's, that's your first five books if you're in Awana. Um, the Pharisees focused a lot on the law. They focus on the law. They're experts in the law. They are the teachers within the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees are more of the politicians within the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus is one of these Pharisees. What else do we know about Nicodemus? He was the teacher of Israel. He was the teacher of Israel. There's a definite article there. The teacher of Israel. This is a... Um, a reference to his position within the Sanhedrin. There were different positions. If you think about uh, the Congress of our nation, there's some people that are up at the top of that, of that group of people. There's like the Speaker of the House, for example, and then there's somebody below him. And the teacher of Israel is one of those high-ranking positions within the Sanhedrin. He was a man of influence, and his focus was primarily on expounding the doctrine of the Jews. So this is a man, and he also, uh, Jesus doesn't call him this, but he would have been called rabbi um, because he is a teacher. So he comes to Jesus by night, and he, he sort of intimates that we see these signs, and because we see these signs, we know you are a teacher come from God. And what is Jesus's response to Nicodemus's statement? In verse uh, three, he immediately talks to him about being born again. You you must be born again. Born again, and the Greek there is intentionally ambiguous. It can also be interpreted born from above. There's a spiritual. There's a there's a I'm going to write it here. There's a spiritual context here. There's also a second context here. It's a second birth. It's a spiritual birth. And Nicodemus does not get it. We, we talked a lot about that last week. Um, there's two reasons why he didn't get it. Who remembers what those two reasons were? One had to do with this phrase, born again. We've talked a little bit about proselytes, that these were Gentiles who became Jews. A Gentile born outside of the Jewish uh, communion of faith 
who wants to become a Jew goes through a process whereby he ends up being a proselyte. And part of that process is baptism. We'll talk a little bit about that today, baptism. And once you are baptized and you become a proselyte, one of the sort of colloquial phrases that they used for that kind of person was being born again. And it's not the sort of spiritual context that Jesus is using here. It, instead, it was more of a, a temporal thing. It was a what you do. Your life was different. You did different things before. You worshiped false gods. You sacrificed to idols. You're leaving all of that behind, renouncing it. You've gone through this process of baptism and circumcision, and you're ceremonially clean, and now you're born into this new life of doing Jewish things. But Jesus is using it here in an intentionally spiritual context. He's also making no distinction between Jew and Gentile. If somebody was born a Jew, they would not need to be born again to become a Jew. They're, they're kind of already a Jew. What do you mean I need to be born again to see the kingdom of God? You mean even, even I have to do that? The other problem he had here is couched in his example that he gives. Let's see. Uh, ben, can you reread for me Nicodemus' response in verse 4? But how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Very good. So there's this, there's this problem with can he enter? Can he enter? It's something that he needs to do. What can he do to actually make this happen? This is a guy who has devoted his life to understanding the law and performing it to the best of his ability in order to achieve a personal righteousness according to the law. And Jesus comes along and says, no, you, you've got to be born from above. It's got to come down to you. It's something that's outside of you that has to then happen to you. And Nicodemus says, how can, how can he enter? How can he do it? When he is old, I mean, he had no input the first time he was born. How is he going to have input now the second time that he is born? And that's where we left off last week. And I didn't want us to walk into this next paragraph of Jesus's without covering that groundwork here, because his response now, whereas his first statement was sort of like kind of unrelated to what Nicodemus had said, he just skipped over to the part he wants to talk about. Now he's directly responding to Nicodemus's statement. So I'll reread this again. Starting in verse 5, Jesus answers, truly, truly, and there's those two words again. We'll talk about that again in a second. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And it's this paragraph that I want us to focus on tonight. If we, if we have lots of extra time after we talk about this paragraph, maybe we'll go on to the next one. But we're going to focus, we're just going to sort of camp right here. Now, he... He sort of repeats and, and clarifies his first statement. His first statement is that one must be born again or born from above. Then he follows it up with this second statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of what? Water and spirit. Bello, you're, you're muted, but I see your lips moving. You're not getting any credit. Sorry about that. I want you to get credit. What did you say so silently before? Uh, I said what Ben said. Water oh. and spirit. Bello said what Ben <laughs> said, and Ben said water and the spirit. So this is one of those passages where we could breeze right through this and go, yeah, I know what that means and not really pay attention to it. And, and this is one of the questions that came up in uh, the online class I taught at work 
on this passage. We, we didn't get into this part either, but one of the follow-up questions at the end of the session was, what does he mean by water and spirit? I want to talk about that. So that's what I want to talk about today. One of the things that sort of jumps out at you when you think of being born of the water and the spirit um, is thinking about this in terms of baptism. That sort of jumps out at you when you start thinking about it. Is he referring to baptism here? Well, to get a, to get a clear picture of that, let's contrast that with something that John says, in, uh, John the Baptist says in John chapter 1. Turn with me to John chapter 1. Just one page back, or two pages back, if you've got a big Bible. Let's go to John chapter 1 um, and verse 24. This is in the middle of that conversation that John the Baptist was having with some of the men that were sent to question him about why he was baptizing just any old buddy that came by in the name of repentance, um, whether it was Jew or Gentile. They had a problem with this. And so they come and ask him a question. Um, now, let's see. Luke, I'm not going to ask you to read while you're driving, but any of Luke's friends, if y'all would be willing to read out loud, can y'all please read for me John chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. Okay, 24 through 27. Yes, sir. And they that were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, why then dost thou baptize, if thou be not Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there hath stood one in the midst of you, whom you know not. The same is he that shall come after me, who is preferred before me, the latchet of those of whose who I am not worthy to lose. Very good. So John here is making an obvious um disparity, an obvious contrast between what he's doing and what the one who's coming after him will do. He says, I baptize with water, but somebody else is coming. And then we don't really see what that maybe that distinction is until we get down to verse 33. So um, I'll read, I'll just read 29 through 33 out loud. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So there's a distinction here in John between the baptism of John, which is baptism of just water, and the baptism of Jesus, which is by the Holy Spirit. That Jesus would be the one who comes in baptism uh, and baptizes by the Spirit. Baptism by the Spirit. So why does he say here, born of water and the Spirit? Because he, he, he goes ahead and uses this word water. And, and so if he's not talking about actually being baptized by water, what is the picture that he's trying to paint? So for this, I want us to turn to another parallel passage in the book of Matthew. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3. If you get to the Old Testament, you went too far. And I went too far. My little Bible only has one ribbon, so I've got to turn back and forth just like you guys. Okay. Matthew, chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptist, and I, I, want to, I get to draw my John the Baptist picture again. So here's there's the horizon, and here's the Jordan River, and here's John the Baptist, and he's wearing his camel hair fuzzy suit like this, and here's a fun staff for him to hold. 
And he's got people all around him who have come to hear him teach and to be baptized in the Jordan River. And the setting for this is that he's out there by the Jordan River baptizing. And then in verse 7, he sees some of these Pharisees and Sadducees coming to see him. And he calls out to them. And it looks, it looks like we've circled back around to um, the first person in our group. So, Dad, if you'll read for, me, for us Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. And as he reads, I want you guys to look for some key words here that have to do with baptism and the Spirit and what the Spirit is being sort of compared to, parallelized with. Listen out for those words, and then we'll talk about them. Dad, you're, you're muted again. You missed the best part. Ah. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Ab for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Very good. So what is he comparing the baptism of the Holy Spirit to here? It's not water. It's another word. Fire. Fire. It's fire. Here he says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then in John, he says you must be born of water and the Spirit. These are parallel phrases. Fire and the Spirit, water and the Spirit. And this is not like an earth, wind, and fire kind of thing. And this isn't like oh, I'm just going to cover all the, the, the bookends here. We've got water and fire. There's something about both water and fire that he's trying to paint a picture for us with. The water here, if we think about being baptized by water, if you've been baptized and, and you fully understand what that connotes, that there is a cleansing aspect here. That, that, that when you're baptized by the Spirit, the Spirit has come into your life and cleansed you. He, he, is, he is washing your sins away, that there's a cleansing aspect here. When we talk about fire and the Spirit, man, fire is all-consuming. Fire goes into every nook and cranny and burns out the dead stuff. That this is a, this baptism by fire, you can imagine going into that. And this is sort of the, the picture of we see when we see um, gold that is being refined. Gold that is refined is put into a crucible and heated so hot that even the surface of the metal is on fire and all the impurities float up to the top and are scooped off and burned away, and all that's left is what's pure. And between these two pictures, we get a, a sense of what he's trying to talk about here. When Jesus says, you must be born again, you must be born from above, in order for you to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born of water and the Spirit. This is Jesus who performs this act, baptizing you by water and the Spirit, baptizing you by fire and the Spirit. This is something that he has to do to you. This isn't something that you can go to the temple, that, that you can go to church and say, hey, I want to be baptized, and that that would make you a part of the kingdom of God. I can tell you from my own personal testimony how I came to know Jesus. I was born, um, and, and, and even from a very young child, I was taken to church. My parents always took me to church. Dad's here. And when I was little, we went to a Methodist church. Well, through a series of circumstances, it wasn't until I was 13 that we started going to a new church. We left the Methodist church, 
went to a Baptist church. I was not saved at the time. I was still thinking, you know, when you, when you die, if you were really good, you go to heaven. If you were bad, you go to hell. I did not understand the gospel at this point. And so we're at a Baptist church, and they would pass the, the communion plate around. And mom told me, you, you can't take communion. The rule here is you have to be baptized in a Baptist church to take communion in a Baptist church. Well, I, she didn't know any better at the time either. So, but that's what I thought. And I, when the plate would come by and I'm sitting with my friends, I would pass it on and they would say, why, why aren't you doing this? And I would say, well, I haven't been baptized in a Baptist church. And they would give me this weird look like, what are you talking about? So one day I got tired of that. And I went down front, didn't tell anybody I was doing it. I walked down the aisle during the uh, invitation time and said, I would like to be baptized. And they said, why? And I said, so that I can take communion. And they didn't skip a beat. They didn't make fun of me. They didn't say, well, you just don't understand. They said, I tell you what, then how about you come back and talk to somebody about baptism later on this week? I said, great. So I rode my bike to church later in the week. My parents didn't bring me. You know, I was close enough. I could just ride my bike and rode my bike to church and met with a man named Rick Carpenter, who was the adult Sunday school pastor. And he's the first person that ever explained the gospel to me in a, in, in a way that I could understand it and I immediately I immediately got it and said that's what I want that's what I want I was regenerated in that instant I was born again in that instant but I was not baptized there is a difference between a water baptism and being baptized by the spirit there there is a difference between going through the act of a public profession of faith and an actual possession of faith that is a result of being born again. There's a difference there. Questions, before I go on, questions. Because that to me, that's, there's a difference. And if you've experienced one and not the other, then you cannot, this is what Jesus is saying, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. The water baptism is not even required to enter the kingdom of God. The thief on the cross that Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He wasn't baptized, but he's in heaven with Jesus right now. So what's required is being baptized by the Spirit, being born again. Bilo, you, un you unmuted. Did you have something to add there? No, I was just, well, I was just about to say what you just said, I think is, is accurate. They are two distinct things, but they're not naturally mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. That's the reason when I used to counsel some of the counselors at a previous church, I would tell them when someone comes down front for a profession of faith, that doesn't mean they are saved. It's your job to go back there with them and, and understand, do they know what they're doing? Do they understand what the desires of their heart is? Do they understand the scripture? Do they understand what the word of God says about a faith, a saving faith being required? Mm -hmm. You know, ask the questions, the hard questions, but let them tell you the story so you can see what's in their heart as opposed to just coming down front and saying, I, I, I believe. And it's just an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. They are definitely two different things. They're just not mutually exclusive because I think many that do go down front for profession are genuinely saved. Yes. Before they go down the aisle. Yes. Dad, did you have something else? Yeah, in the context that you, you're teaching tonight, um, it strikes me, though, that the, the thief on the cross was baptized uh, in the Spirit, just not in the water. And I think that's one of the things we have a tendency to leave out as we have those discussions. Yep, absolutely. I had, I had another question, though. As I read this, I don't, I mean, I couldn't sit here and say, 100%, I guess, one way or the other. But do you not think that there's room when you do the, the study on this that maybe perhaps sometimes we should maybe take the scripture literally unless it demands a different hermeneutical approach? And in this case, it, it would appear almost to me that verse six is almost a commentary on verse five. I mean, Nicodemus, um, Nicodemus's first question was related to almost a facetious question from a physical standpoint. 
and Jesus responds to him, water in the spirit, perhaps there is room to at least consider that he's saying, look, you, you have to be born. Yes. Mm -hmm. Physically born, which is, you know, three waters. Everybody, everybody knows about the water breaking before birth. But, but then he clarifies it in the spirit. So it's like he's, there's, uh, a, there's almost a distinction drawn there to me. And so then you're saying three, he follows it up in verse six and says, let me clarify it for you. What's flesh is flesh, but what's spirit is spirit, spirits of God. And it does, there's nothing you have to do with that. That's all in the hands of God. Okay, so you're when, saying the water there is referring to your first birth. The spirit then is your second birth. Yeah. In other words, in, the, in these, so then, then verse six is referring to flesh and spirit as a result. Right. I'm just saying that it would almost appear that there's room to consider that. I, um, I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I'm not saying that these are, I'm not saying, uh, yeah, I, I can see that. How about that? I can see that. Dad, you got your hand up. If I may, uh, the, the, the comment, the comment from my Bible at the footnote down here says, some suggest that the water is the release of fluid that accompanies the physical birth, but linguistically consider, considerations point to understanding water and spirit as referring to a single spiritual birth. I'm only reading that as a, as a footnote at the bottom of my page. Yeah. Yeah. I and kept trying to get, I kept trying to get clarification on that. And I got at the end when I started reading, what Dr. Ryrie put on here and Dr. Ryrie gives you five different possible meanings that are popular. Yeah. And of course he always is good in parentheses to put, but this would not, you know, coincide with scripture and the ones that he left at it saying that, you know, these are the ones most plausible or, or the two that we're discussing. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Before we go on to verse six, I, I do want to bring up one point that, came up in a conversation that I've had since we had our class last week. And that is this concept of um, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this was in the context of I, you know, I talked to somebody, I witnessed to them and they rejected it. Here we're talking about a necessary condition to be able to even see the kingdom of God. Last week we called that being under spiritual blindness. And I want to give this to you as a point of encouragement. If we are, until we are born again, in spiritual blindness, that means that when you go to witness to somebody, to present to them the gospel, and they're not born again. They're unregenerate. They're still in that same state that they were when they were born the first time. And the Holy Spirit is not working in their heart to quicken and renew it. When you go to explain the gospel to them, that's like trying to explain color to a blind man. They're not even going to be able to perceive what you're talking about. They're not even going to understand what you're talking about. What in the world are you babbling on about? You may ask, well, why is that encouraging? Well, if, if it takes the Holy Spirit working in their heart in order for them to see the spiritual truths and understand them and accept them, the, the Bible's pretty clear that the Holy Spirit uses the means and occasion of you expressing the gospel to them in words as the time when the Holy Spirit does its work of regeneration. Which means that when you go and talk to somebody, they may say no today, but God has planned to work in their heart tomorrow. So you go back to them tomorrow and you tell them the gospel and they may receive it. And there are people that we've heard of, we could tell stories about people that at the very end of their life, having been uh, tried to be persuaded to the gospel by, by loved ones their entire life, it wasn't until they were on their deathbed that they accepted the gospel. That doesn't mean that everything they did up until that point was just doing it wrong. It just means that that's the moment when the Holy Spirit decided to work in that person's heart. So let that be an encouragement to you, that the Holy Spirit is doing that battle, and that they may reject it, 
but they're not rejecting you. There is a spiritual blindness there preventing them. So pray that the Holy Spirit would release them from that, would, would work in their heart, regenerate their, their heart of flesh, and baptize them by the Spirit so they understand the gospel and accept it and are saved. I wanted to say that briefly before we went on. All right, so in verse 6, we've covered, we've got 12 minutes left, and we've, we've made it two verses. All right, in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The commentators that I read pointed verse 6 as being now a direct response to what he said in verse 4. There was this old man. How can, a, how can a man, when he is old, be born again? And Jesus is sort of pointing back to this and saying, even if he could climb back into his mother's womb and be born again a second time, it wouldn't work because that would still be being born in the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That won't accomplish it. It has to be being born of the Spirit. You must be born again from above. Uh, we can see this picture throughout nature. I can't plant a, an okra seed and an onion come up. I can't plant, I'm a gardener, I can't plant squash and green beans come up. That's not how that works. We're, we're born from the seed that is sown. This, this, if we went on an aside, we could also say you can't get from the genetic information in an amoeba to the genetic information in a human being. This idea that you can evolve species over time is, just doesn't even make sense from a genetics perspective. The same thing is here. What makes up a spiritual birth is not the same material as what makes up a spiritual birth. That's the picture he's drawing there. In verse 7, he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Here, I, I feel like we got to get a, a sense that Nicodemus has been standing here, and he's had sort of a frown on his face. That's not very good. Let's try for a better frown. He sort of had the, a, a frown on his face because he's like, I don't, I don't get it. You know, question marks all around like this. And then as Jesus continues to talk, his, his confusion and his concern sort of turns into this, like, wow, what, wow, how come, how come I didn't know this? And he sort of got this kind of like sly grin, like, wow, really? And, and Jesus is saying, well, don't marvel at this. He says, right, how about we do this? You're marveling at the mystery of what I'm talking about. How about I use a mystery in nature to give us another word picture? And that's why he starts talking about wind. He goes from talking about um, these concepts in spiritual terms. He says, all right, let's get a word picture and we'll use the wind. Billo, can you reread for me verses um, seven and eight? Uh, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Very good. So this word wind in the Greek is pneuma. Oh, that's supposed to be a U. And you're probably going to ask me, why did, why did I write in Greek? Let's try to write in Greek. Nu, there's probably an, an E. Um, this is terrible. What's mu alpha? There you go. Numa. P N E U M A. Did I get it right? No. I don't right. have a clue. Yeah, Numa. Uh, the reason why I say this, um, you might have heard of the, the the word pneumatics, like a pneumatic pump. This is a pump that pushes air. Numa is sort of this onomopoetic word that, that, that sounds like it is. When you say pneuma, it's sort of like you're blowing air out of your mouth. Pneuma. That's what the word used for wind is. Guess what the word is for spirit in Greek? The same. Pneuma. Uh-oh. 
he's using the same word in a different context. There's, a, there's an obvious word play here. How do we know that he's not talking about spirit in verse 8? Well, because he's talking about blowing. It blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or it goes by context. Oh, now he's talking about wind. But he's making an obvious parallel with the spirit. So the mystery here is about the wind. Now, in Jesus' day, they didn't know a whole lot about the mechanics of wind. How does that work? Why does the air move around? Are there even air particles? They didn't know any of this stuff. But it still doesn't matter. If you and I were to walk outside, and you could be a scientist with a PhD and know all about weather patterns and all of that, and yet you cannot stand outside with the wind blowing around and point with your finger and say, the wind is coming from that spot over there, and it's going to end up over here. You don't know. It's just happening around you. This is a, this is a, a mystery because there are things about this process that we don't comprehend. There are things about this process that we don't understand. The spirit is moving around where it wants to. It is a person. The spirit is one of the three persons of the Trinity with a will all of his own. This is the will of God. It moves where it wants to. It goes into a person when it wants to. It works on a person's heart when it wants to. And you and I cannot perceive it. I have seen evidence, for example, that Ben is saved. I see fruit in his life that that's the best I can do. I don't know, actually, if the Spirit has worked in his heart. But Ben does, and the Holy Spirit makes it evident to Ben because of what he's doing in Ben. He's feeling things he did not feel before. He's learning things he did not learn before. There's a difference inside him that he is sure of that give him hope that we cannot see. And there's a mystery here. And so Jesus is sort of saying to, to Nicodemus, look, you don't actually have to fully comprehend the workings of the Spirit in order to believe that the Spirit has to do this work in you for you to be born again. If I had to fully understand the inner thoughts of God and how things work on the spiritual realm for me to be saved, I would never be saved. There's no chance. And this is part of why Jesus says it, it's, we have to have faith like little children. Little kids don't understand everything, but they still believe what you tell them. And, and I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad. I take advantage of that all the time. I, I tell my kids the most wild things, and they believe me. You know, they ask me, well, how does this work? And I make up some crazy way of, oh, really, that's great. You know, to them, everything is magic, and they'll just take what you say at face value. And then I come back along and go, no, 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 let me really show you how it works, okay? But they will. They'll just believe you. And that's, that's sort of the sense that we need to have. We, like children, have to see these things um, that are happening that the Spirit is doing and believe He's doing it. And believe that even though I don't understand how that's going to work, I, even though that's outside of my control, the wind starts over here, it goes somewhere else, I have no effect on it, but I can see it happening. I can see what it's done. I still have to believe in that. And that's what he's asking Nicodemus to trust in. There's also a sense here in which when we recognize that the workings of the Spirit are outside of our control, when he says, can he enter? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. The wind blows where it wants to blow. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. There is a sense in which Jesus is hinting at the sovereignty of the new birth. We've talked about how the new birth is a second birth. It is a supernatural birth. It is a spiritual birth. But it is also a sovereign birth. He also hinted at this in John chapter 1 when he says that, that he gave them the right to be born again, to, to become children of God, those who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God's in control here, that this is a 
sovereign earth. And we ended exactly where I wanted us to end, right on time, 728. Um, we're going to continue in the next at least two weeks to talk about this conversation Nicodemus has with Jesus. And Jesus is going to continue to unfold. It's, it's sort of going to come in, it's going to feel like faster and faster, even though there's not that many verses left in this conversation. He's going to start unfolding deep spiritual truths about salvation as a whole and his role in it. He's going to explain to Nicodemus things that his disciples are not going to get to witness for another three years. He's going to explain to Nicodemus things that aren't going to happen until his second coming. And he's going to explain to Nicodemus the reason why the world is going to reject him. And we're going to see all that over the next two weeks. So, thoughts? Questions? Yeah, looking forward to it. Sweet. No, uh, Scott, did you say are we, are we going to meet next week? You talked last week about not meeting next week, I think. Um, well, I had mentioned that I would like to take a break sometime yeah. for a couple of weeks, maybe. Um, however, I'd like to finish this conversation with okay. Demas first. Sounds good to me. So maybe we'll do the next two weeks. Now, I have received a request to change the time of our class from 6.30 to 7. So I know that we've got some who um, have trouble getting off work in time to get here at 6.30. 7 might be easier for them. My wife has also said that it's difficult to do homeschool plus cook dinner, eat dinner, and then be here for 6.30. Um, the difference is when we do this at church, we can all just run to church and Miss Bobby's already made all the food. So there's a lot less work to do. Um, but we, we miss her. We miss Miss Bobby. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you guys if it would be okay to change times to seven o'clock or if that would be pushing it too late for anybody. I'm good with seven. The only I'm thing good. right now, my D groups need at 730, but I'll see if I can get them to move back to eight. Okay, look it up and tell me, because if there's a conflict, then we'll see what we can do. Yeah, I'll tell, I'll, I'm about to meet with them right now, so I'll, I'll text you and see if they need to move back to it. Okay. Just, just consider my vote is the same as whatever Ben says. What Ben said. Nice. I'm, I'm, support, I'm supporting Ben. <laughs> oh, oh y'all are y'all are D-grouped together. <laughs> no. no? Okay. No, my my D-group's going to be on Zoom Thursday night. Okay. Um, another thing that I thought of was I've been communicating by email to a large group of men, but it's difficult to bring men into an email chain and then have other conversations outside the email chain. And, um, and so I know our, my Sunday school class has been communicating by group me that that may be an easier way for us to communicate. Do any of you guys have any opposition to that? Switching to a group me group. I don't even know what they're called. I guess they're called groups. Um, for me. As long as it's an email that shows up in my email box, I'm good with it. It's not an email. It's an app on your phone and oh, okay. or you can have it also sent by text. But it's a it's it's like a group text that's more easily manageable. It's like group chat, but it's on your phone. Um, or you can log in on your computer and have it in a browser. Do I, do I need to download something on my phone? You have to download the GroupMe app. But um, you're, Billo, you're in Shep's class. There is a group yeah, me. I, I did the, clicked on the link in the, uh, in the email that time. I've been wondering why I've never seen anything. I guess because I never got the app on the phone. Okay, that's probably why. Yeah, download the app and log yeah. in and you'll start getting <laughs> all the stuff. I'm trying to hold back the laughter. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, then I will send out like a, a broad email, sign up, get in the group me if I can figure out how to set it up and then um, and we'll go from there and maybe that'll help us communicate easier about things like this. You're really pushing us on the guys with this technology. <laughs> <laughs> I, I um, honestly, better would be let's go, all go to church and hug each other and have fun. Like I hands down would do that any day above what we're doing right here. But this, at least we get to continue to see each other's ugly faces and, and dwell in the word together. So if there were girls here, I'd say we had, I think we have some girls, but I don't see their faces. They're, they're over there generally categorized as Luke's friends. 
So, all right. Well, um, Billo, can you close us in prayer? And Ben, I know you've got seven, your D group at 730. If you need to drop off, don't worry about us. All right, guys. Y'all have a good evening. See you, Ben. See you, Ben. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. And uh, thanks for uh, just the Lord technology and everything else in this world can be perverted and used in the wrong way. But we thank real thankful it can be used to glorify your name, to promote the gospel, dear Lord, to increase the uh, effect of discipleship and Bible study and, and camaraderie. So, dear Lord, we just thank you for that. And I thank you for Scott's prep and uh, all those who joined the call tonight. I just pray for those homes and just, dear Lord, be with our community as we continue through this process of this COVID-19. Watch over those, dear Lord, who've been affected so adversely and will be faithful to lift them up in prayer. Be with us through this coming week. And we love you with all our heart. Go in the do pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See y'all. Uh, y'all have a good one. Paul, you're still muted. <laughs>